and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you ever consider what it would be like to literally sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him teach and preach. And if you had the opportunity to ask him any kind of question, maybe theological or something else, what would you ask him? Well, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus addresses any number of subjects that are just as relevant today as when they were first spoken. He speaks about such things as persecution. He speaks about the dangers of worry. He also speaks about uh, division, division within the family. And that's the basis of the lesson for today. Today's lesson is often misunderstood and certainly unsettling to many, even Christians. So it is that Jesus tells us, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth, but rather division. For from now on, families will be divided against one another on account of me. And this is the very word of our God that we'll look at this morning as it is found for us in Luke chapter 12. Well, you know, one thing about Jesus is that he never, ever beats around the bush. He begins with the words, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth, but rather division. So what's Jesus talking about? It sounds like an apparent contradiction from what he says in other places in Scripture. Maybe it would be helpful to think about it this way. This last week I went to the doctor's office uh, because I had another cyst on my finger. And so does the doctor, does the doctor heal or does the doctor hurt? And sometimes the doctor does what? Both of those things. Does Jesus bring division or does he bring peace? Of course he brings both of those things. Think about when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a heavenly host sang what? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Shortly thereafter, an old man by the name of Simeon held the baby Jesus in his arms. And what did he say? He said, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of God's people, Israel. And then Simeon said something that was truly prophetic. He said to Mary, the mother of Jesus, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. And then he looked at Mary directly and he said, and Mary, a sword will pierce your own heart as well. So what's the deal with that? You know, again, these words of Jesus often strike us as a harsh reality that thankfully many of us uh, never had to face. You know, many of us grew up in a family where our mom, our dad, our brothers, and our sisters were all on the same side of the line, on the same page concerning Jesus. It's not because we were perfect, it's not because we were out without sin, but hopefully we grew up in a family where God's forgiveness and his love abounds. Jesus did not come into this world to bring temporal peace, but eternal peace. The kind of peace that he would establish between a holy God and sinful people. And so in this lesson, Jesus uses vivid concrete language. He talks about fire and baptism and he talks about division and his words are personal and his words are dramatic and passionate. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, open them now to uh, Luke chapter 12 beginning with verse 49. Here he says this, I came to cast a fire on this earth and how I wish that it were already kindled. And I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress. How I wish that it were already accomplished. How I wish that it were already over. Do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? No, but rather division. In this lesson, Jesus 
is prophetic. He's always prophetic. But what he is speaking about here is what he knows he is about to endure through his suffering, his crucifixion, and his death on the cross. The fire and the bloody baptism is just that. His suffering, his crucifixion, and his death. Not only because of the physical torments that he would undergo, but also because he knew that the very wrath of his heavenly Father would literally be poured out upon his head in full measure. But even worse than that, he knew what the side effects of the gospel would bring. That it would bring division among people. Now understand, that's not the fault of the gospel. Because the gospel indeed does bring peace. The fault, on the other hand, is sin. The sin that, that Jesus is about to die for is going to cause divisions among people, divisions even in families. Certainly it's true what the prophet Isaiah says when he calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. Certainly Jesus is speaking the truth when he says to his disciples on Easter Sunday evening, fear not, peace be with you. Again, he is talking about a peace between a holy God and sinful people. This is the kind of peace that is to reside in your heart as a believer. It is a peace that is beyond understanding. It is a peace that you have that comes from knowing that your sins are forgiven. It's a kind of peace that comes from knowing that you have the promise of everlasting life. You know, there's a lot of people in the world today who would hope that the gospel would bring uh, some sort of peace or some sort of utopia here on this earth. But it will never happen. Because of sinfulness, Jesus divides like nothing else, even more so than, dare I say, politics. You know, ever since the beginning, ever since sin, there's been divisions. A division between a husband and wife by the name of Adam and Eve. Division between two brothers named Cain and Abel. Uh, divisions uh, between even two guys who die on either side of Jesus. The one thief repents of his sin and believes in Christ and is saved. And the other guy refuses. But Jesus said, I came to cast fire on this earth and how I wish that it were already kindled. That fire started when Jesus died on the cross. And that fire has been burning ever since. Understand, Jesus did not want strife and division. When he said, how I wish that it were already kindled, he's really in essence saying, how I wish that it were already over. You know, Jesus wished that the fire was already kindled and the baptism, his bloody baptism would already be over with. Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, underwent a water baptism. At the end of his ministry, he undergoes this bloody baptism, his suffering and death and crucifixion, whereby he would establish a peace between God and sinners. Jesus literally would atone for the sin of the world. He dreads the cross and the divisions that will come. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't shrink from the cross. He is determined to go to the cross. He is determined. He keeps his eyes fixed on it throughout his ministry. Of course, one of the painful effects of the gospel is divisions that occur even within families. Some of you here this morning, no doubt, know what that's like. Maybe you have a brother or a sister or a mom, or a dad. How is it so that some believe in Jesus as their Savior, and others don't? And still others are completely indifferent. You know, it hurts, especially for those of you who have gone through that, or are experiencing it right now as we speak. Take comfort in the fact that Jesus knows your pain. 
Jesus knew what that was like to have his own family divided concerning him. Remember, there was one point in his ministry where his own brothers wanted to take charge of him because they thought he was out of his mind. It wasn't until after his resurrection that his brothers believed in him. But that didn't stop him from going to the cross. Jesus' ministry always creates division. We can see it in the world today. Mention the name of Jesus, mention Christianity, and immediately sets up division. It's greater today seemingly than it has ever been before in my lifetime. Think about the divisions that Jesus created even within the religious establishment in his day. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes, they just couldn't wrap their mind around the fact that Jesus reached out to outcast sinners, tax collectors, the woman at the well, the list goes on and on and on. And still today, the teachings of Jesus cause division. You know, there are many people... Uh, you ask them about Jesus, and they would say uh, that, oh yeah, this Jesus, he was a historical person. He was a kind man. He was a good teacher. Some people even refer to Jesus as the, the, a higher being, or the guy upstairs. But still, there are some people, by saying those things, do not recognize him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They do not recognize him as their Savior. So I think here's the big question for all of us in this. You know, how do you deal with these kinds of divisions in your life? First of all, remember this. Jesus knows your sadness. He was tempted in every way, just like we are, but without sin. And then on what particular occasion, what did Jesus say? He said, in this world, you will have what? Tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Secondly, keep on witnessing to your loved ones. You know, sometimes they're going to get mad at you. And it's their attempt to shut you up so that you never speak about Jesus again. I don't think that's the right move. I think you should continue to speak to them about your Savior, not in an obnoxious way, but in a winsome way. And certainly keep praying for them. Hold them up every single day in your prayers. And something else, I think you need to make sure that you keep on hearing the Word of God daily. Not only hear the word of God, but be regular in your worship attendance because I can guarantee you those on the other side of the line are watching you. Keep on receiving the sacrament because as we hear God's word, as we receive his body and blood, he strengthens us through all of these trials. And even if you don't find any support among your earthly family, know that you have a church family. Reach out to them. Don't assume that they know what you're going through. Ask them to help you. Ask them to pray for you. After all, sometimes those of us who are united by faith in the blood of Jesus sometimes are closer than blood relatives anyway. And if you're forsaken by your biological family, know that you have a family of believers. Soon, very soon, we're going to see a division of the house. Even more so than what it is here in the month of August. I think that we often see a great division of the house when September rolls around. Division of the house is actually a parliamentary term that I learned in FFA. We had parliamentary procedures. So a division of the house is when the body doesn't agree and you take a voice vote and you can't understand, you know, are there more people for it or against it? So a division of the house calls for a standing vote or simply a vote of raising your hand. September is rolling around. And with that, a renewed emphasis on Christian education. Sunday school, 
confirmation classes, Bible studies for all ages, and worship. And I can guarantee you that in many houses on Sunday morning or Saturday night, maybe this has happened at your house, there's a division of the house. There's some who are going to argue with you and make excuses. You've heard them before. I don't want to go to church. It's what? Boring. I already believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. What do I need to be there for? Or the game's going to start early, and I don't want to miss the beginning of the game. Or it's too hot, or it's too cold, and the list goes on and on and on. I guess what I'm saying to you today, especially those of you who are parents and grandparents, do not cave in to the excuses that you're going to hear. You know, I remember using some of those same excuses with my mom and with my dad. I remember one time telling my mother on a nice summer day, I'm not going to church today. You know what my mother said to me? She said, well, you can do that if you want to. But if you want to spend another day in this house, this is what we, and she used the we word, this is what we do together as a family. And, you know, it's pretty hard to argue with my mom and dad, especially when my dad would get up at 5 o'clock on Sunday morning to milk cows before going to church. You know, it pains me beyond measure when I see more and more families who see little or no value in Sunday school, confirmation, or even worship. Those of us who are parents, we have a tremendous responsibility that God has entrusted to us to tell the next generation. You know what those words are from Deuteronomy chapter 5? Train up a child in the way they will go, and when they are old, they will never depart from it. You know, I didn't thank my mother at the time. I was pretty upset. But you know, today I thank God for godly parents Think about it this way. Think about some of the ungodly influences that our children face today that we never had to face. Think about the whole internet and the Facebook and the computer and the list goes on and on and on. If ever there was a time that our children and we need to have our spiritual buckets filled to overflowing, it is today. And I can tell you that there is indeed coming a time soon when there will be a division of the house. It's called the last great division of the house. And that will take place publicly on Judgment Day. When Jesus separates the believers from the unbelievers. And to those who courageously confess their faith, In Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what will he say to you on that day? He will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Remember those other words of Jesus? Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge him or her before my Father who is in heaven. And finally, one last thing, take heart. Because there is coming a day when there will be no division of the house. When God calls us home to be with him in heaven. A place of perfect peace and perfect unity. That's the good word from Christ our King this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we say today thank you. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Lord, it's tough to be a parent. It's tough to be a guardian. It's tough to set the example in our world today. It calls for stick-to-itiveness. It calls for the faith that we read about in the book of Hebrews. Lord, help us to boldly proclaim our faith as we take God's word seriously ourselves, as we read it and mark it and take it to heart. And Lord, help us to joyfully say this, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. So Lord, be with my brothers and sisters here in this place. Be with them. I know you promised to do that through the good times as well as the difficult days of our life. Help us to run the race, to throw off everything that hinders, and to run with perseverance 
as we keep our eyes fixed on you. We pray it and we ask it in your name and all of God's people said, Amen. We gather our tithes and our offerings.